Next speaker is Annie Machong. She is a MR5 whistleblower. And suddenly my notes are gone. Um, she is currently the director of LEAP, the Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And for people who missed it out last night, she had a, uh, a talk about the four wars. And uh, the talk was about the three wars, if you're going to look it up, but it expanded into the four wars. And today she's going to talk about the war on drugs. So please welcome Annie Machon. I think that's the end of my dignity for this talk, so I hope you enjoy the rest of it. <laughs> Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And um, it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to expand on one of the subjects that I touched on last night when I was talking about what I see to be the four wars that our governments and leaders are engaged in against us, which effectively I distill down to the idea of the war on our freedoms. And last night I mentioned in my view, that the war on terror has been used to terrorize large parts of the planet and also to shred our civil liberties. The war on drugs has been used for five decades now for the same purpose. And then, of course, we have the ongoing war on the internet, on free media, uh, against piracy and transparency and WikiLeaks and the free flow of our information. And then finally, of course, now, what we're seeing in the US particularly, but we've seen for decades in the UK, is the war on whistleblowers. And of course, Edward Snowden has been much in the news again today. But I have the opportunity now to expand one of those segments, which is the war on drugs. And I want to do this because, despite my somewhat um, colorful past, shall we say, in terms of being a whistleblower, one of the organizations I now represent and I now work with is called Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, Thank you. Um, which is truncated down to LEAP. So I'll just reiterate that. It is Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And this is an organization that is very young. It only started in uh, 11 years ago, uh, 2002, and it was set up by a small group of retired police officers in the US. And they were all very senior police officers. And once they'd retired, they suddenly looked back over their careers and they've been involved in trying to enforce the drug laws in the US, which are mad and draconian and completely over the top. And they decided that in, they needed to campaign for a rethink about the failed law of prohibition. LEAP since then has exploded exponentially in terms of membership and support. We now have over 100,000 supporters we have speakers all over the world, and we have representation in 120 countries of the world. So it has grown massively in little over a decade. And what LEAP offers, what it presents, is a very different voice in the debate about drugs and the debate around prohibition. We have a situation where many of the key speakers in LEAP are judges or lawyers, prison governors, former spies, policemen, and even three drug czars, those who are government advisors who are supposed to enforce the drug laws. In fact, we've even got the former drug czar of the EU very much on side and very much speaking out now about the failure of prohibition. And as I said, this started in the US and it's grown exponentially, but in the US, of course, that is the country which is the fountainhead of these crazy, crazy prohibition laws. America has been the driving force behind prohibition for the last five decades. And it is surely in America that resistance to that idea was going to first raise its head in a meaningful way. So you have a bunch of people who, from their professional experience, all the way through very successful careers in many cases, 
are now saying that the law that they had to uphold, which was decided on by politicians, has failed. It is causing damage on a global scale, it is causing damage on a national scale, and it causes, of course, huge damage to local communities and on the personal scale, where people can be criminalized for deciding to ingest a certain substance. So LEAP has uh, grown exponentially, and I'm very proud to be the European director of it and to try and build our presence in Europe, both as an educational force but also as an advocacy group that can feed in <coughs> our professional experience into the policy and the decision-making that is taken not only by our national governments, but also by the EU. And this is key because we need to make the case nationally, on a European level, and then also at the UN level to try and end prohibition. And the UN is the key issue, the key area of the fight because the UN, of course, is the organization that started the prohibition laws. We had the UN Convention uh, Declaration in 1961. In 1971, which spurred Richard Nixon on to launch the so-called War on Drugs. And, of course, 1988. And since then, all those conventions were ratified in 2012. And this was at the diplomatic circle jerk, sorry, um, the UN convention in Vienna, <laughs> where everyone agreed that, of course, prohibition is working wonderfully. It's been a, a raging success. We will still continue to fight the war on drugs in order to ensure that we will have a drug-free world. Well, think about it. These laws have been in place for 50 years. And what have we seen in those 50 years? We have seen an exponential growth in illegal drug use. We have seen the availability become endemic. We have seen the strength and potency of the drugs grow enormously. And they say that the war on drugs is being won, that we are going to eradicate them from the world. Prohibition has driven this underground, and prohibition has created an illicit black market, and prohibition has contributed to an explosive drug use growth. So, by any definition, this law is a failure. I and mean, if you think back to the 1920s in America, where they prohibited alcohol, this is precisely what happened then. You would think the Americans would have learnt the lesson then. Because not only did prohibition of alcohol drive the booze market underground, it also meant that the trade, the market itself, was then pushed into the hands of organized crime. In fact, that was the, the real birth of organized crime large-scale crime, and that started in America. So you would think the Americans would have learned, but oh no. They pushed prohibition of drugs, and we're now seeing the explosion of drug use and the explosion of organized crime around that market. But it gets worse, and this is why I became involved with LEAP, because I used to work for MI5, which is the UK Domestic Security Service, and they are tasked not only to protect national security, but also to protect the economic well-being of the UK. And of course, with this huge global drug market, it is subverting the economic well-being of the UK. But the reason I became aware of the failure of the drug issue was that in uh, 1993 to 1995, I was in charge of investigating terrorist logistics in and out of the UK, which sounds terribly grand, but what it basically means is we were looking for the smuggling of people and weapons into and out of the UK who might be involved in terrorist activity. Now, that, of course, meant that I had to work very closely with UK Customs because they are the organization charged with investigating the movement of any illicit drug into and out of the UK. And working with them all across the country at ports and airports and in the investigations division. And working with these guys and talking to them and running operations with them, I became very aware that they knew they were fighting a losing battle. They could not keep drugs out of the UK, even though it's an island. It was incredibly easy for the drug cartels and for the terrorists to move stuff into and out of small ports or using whatever method they chose. 
So we have a situation where they both, the customs people looking for drugs basically said, the war on drugs has failed, and it is like looking for a needle in a haystack, and the haystack just gets bigger. So even then, even in the 1990s, I knew that the, the war on drugs was a failure. But it was only uh, four years ago that I was approached by Leap to become a speaker, because I was talking out about a whole range of other issues and civil liberties. And only last year that I became the director of Leap. But looking at that terrorist connection, it is so stark. And I started digging away at that link, at that issue. And it turns out, it turns out that over half the organizations currently designated to be terrorist across the planet receive the bulk of their funding from the underground drug market. So on the one hand, we are making a law prohibiting drugs so that the drug trade goes underground and that drug trade falls into the hands of organized crime and terrorist groups. And yet on the other hand, we are trying to fight the war on terror. So what our security complexes are doing is giving with one hand and taking away with the other. It's a crazy situation. But to look more specifically, my perspective was looking at arms and people coming in from Northern Ireland. And it was incredibly easy for them to do. They worked very closely with the organized drug cartels in order to facilitate that trade. In fact, many of the terrorist organizations at the height of this civil war in Northern Ireland in the 1990s were primarily funded by the drug trade. So if the drug trade had not been illegal, um, if we could have regulated it, it would have taken all this money out of the hands of these people. But it gets worse, because if you look globally, it's not just about our countries. We are the rich West. We are the consumer countries. We are the ones that drive this market because we want to consume stuff that comes from other countries. The other two categories of countries that get terribly affected tend to be, one, the producer countries, most notoriously Latin America, uh, from the 70s onwards, they have been the key producer of cocaine, and the war on drugs has been waged viciously against them by the US, and this has created militarized states, rampant violence, rampant corruption, and hundreds and thousands, if not millions of people killed in the crossfire. But there's also, of course, other countries, for example, Afghanistan, which is the key producer of the opiate poppy, the opium poppy, and then the heroin trade. Now, of course, you'll remember there was this little, little war there a few years ago when the West went in to gratefully liberate the Afghanis and bring them democracy against the evil Taliban. Well, it now turns out that since that, and since all the billions and billions of dollars we as countries in the West spent trying to bring democracy, in fact, all we brought was violence, that the drug trade has exploded in Afghanistan. It is now estimated that it's worth half a billion dollars a year. Sorry, no, 500 billion, a million dollars a year, half a billion dollars a year. And that is all under the control of the Taliban, who are then deemed to be our terrorist enemies. This is huge. But other countries have been through the same thing. I mean, Colombia is notorious for being a cocaine producer. And one of the revolutionary terrorist groups there, FARC, has also accrued a huge amount of money through this illegal drug trade. They estimate that every year, FARC will raise about $300 million per year through the trade in cocaine. So this is huge, but that's, the, that's just the producer countries, and there is no incentive for them to change the crops they grow because nothing else will yield them that sort of income. And all that income is channeled into the black market. And what we've seen from that, I mean, the, the global estimate of the annual drug trade is estimated by the UN, which is a very conservative organization, as between 320 billion and half a trillion dollars per year. I think this is the third biggest trade block in the world, and it is all in the hands of organized crime and terrorists. This is the biggest crime wave the world has ever seen, 
and it was created specifically by the UN prohibition laws that have been in place for the last 50 years. And this affects not only our societies, our communities, it affects communities and countries around the world. So, as I mentioned, there are the producer countries, Colombia, most of the Latin American countries, many Middle Eastern countries. Then there are, of course, the consumer countries which we are part of. We create that market. But, of course, stuck in the middle as well are a number of developing countries which become the transit countries for this illegal drugs trade. And recently, over the last few years, we've seen the drug routes shift, and they tend to be going now through Africa, from Latin America through Africa into Europe, and of course from Latin America through Mexico into the USA. So what we've seen in Mexico, for example, is a ramped up war on drugs, funded and supported by the US government. And in the last six years since that started, 70,000 people, is, it's estimated, we don't know the exact figures, 70,000 people in Mexico have died in the crossfire of that war on drugs. And many in the most gruesome ways that you get situations where they are beheaded or they are eviscerated and left out on display. This is not just shootings. And this is done to protect American consumers and stop people taking drugs in the USA. And of course, in, Ameri in uh, Africa, North Africa, which is one of the other big transit routes I mentioned between Latin America and Europe, we're seeing a similar pattern, where states which are fairly unstable to begin with become completely destabilized by this new influx of a black market trade. And there are certain states that are notorious now, Guinea-Bissau on the west, Mali, Libya even, because they have been destabilized anyway, the drugs are now flowing through with very few checks, and they are what are now called narco-states. There is no rule of law, there is no real government, it is entirely corrupted by this illegal drug trade. So when we talk about the war on drugs, it's not just about what happens in our Western countries, what happens to our friends or our relatives or our neighbors who might dabble a bit. This has global consequences to many, all these different countries for all these different reasons. And it has created effectively a sort of drug holocaust. And this is what prohibition has done. Plus, where does all this money go? Who is handling it? Who is laundering it? Because it's black money, how do they manage it? What do they do with it? This has created drug cartels with more profit per year than you know, some many countries' GDP. And of course, this has sustained our broken financial system, where we have banks that are bankrupt. We all know about the financial crisis. There have been scandals after scandals of banks being caught out money laundering for these drug cartels, particularly and most notoriously Wachovia in 2004, I think it was, which was caught and fined, and some of the executives were about possibly to be prosecuted, but, you know, never happened, because they were then bought out by a bigger American bank, Wells Fargo, and a deal was cut. And similarly, last year, one of the Brit big British banks, one of the banks that was too big to fail, HSBC, got caught out money laundering for the Mexican drug cartels. And I think they paid a fine of about 1.2 billion. But hey, they can afford it. They get all their money from the taxpayers. What's a fine? So this has kept a lot of corrupt banks afloat. And in fact, don't believe me when I say that. The person who made the most famous quote about this was the former um, head of the drug section, Unidoc, in the UN a man called Antonio Maria Costa, who in 2008, just, uh, sorry, 2009, just after the financial crisis struck, went on the record and said, the only reason that most global banks have any liquidity whatsoever is because of all the black and the gray money coming out of this global drug trade. That is the scale of what we're against. This is the result of prohibition and driving this trade underground. So, as I mentioned before, 
This is the biggest crime wave the world has ever seen. It is corrupting whole nation states. It is corrupting our financial institutions. It is corrupting our governmental institutions. And also it is creating damage to us, we the people, be it through criminalization, be it through health issues. And it's just so, it's just a mad idea that you have a situation where a law, some laws were put in place 50 years ago, which have not only failed, but have also promoted and grown the very thing they're trying to prevent. And yet all our governments still go back and say, let's do more of it. It's bound to work now if we ramp up the pressure and do the same thing again and again and again. And this, of course, is um, Einstein's definition of insanity. Something doesn't work, you try it again, expecting a different outcome. So that's the current situation with the drug laws. The other issue, which particularly affects people from law enforcement against prohibition, is the impact it's had on law enforcement. Because this has seen a breakdown of the social contract between those who are policed and those who police. The law has become an ass. I think most people in this room will at least know someone who has dabbled in something. If you want to go, well, we're in the Netherlands, I mean, you can go out and smoke a bit of weed and you went up in prison. That's fantastic. In the UK, for example, you can face criminal prosecution for ingesting a drug of your choice as a consensual adult, which does not cause harm to other people. And many people do, despite the risks. So in the UK, you'll probably get a fine, you might have your weed taken off you. If you're very unlucky, you might get a short prison sentence. In America, if you're caught three times in some states with a joint in your pocket, you can face life in prison without parole under the three strikes and you're out. And despite this, the market in America has grown exponentially since the 1970s, despite that risk. And other countries are far worse. I mean, I'm talking about the West here, but if you look at other countries like Russia, who are very draconian around the drug laws, who see you as a criminal immediately if you want to ingest something into your own body and won't harm anyone else, you are put in prison. You are potentially made to do forced labor. And of course, then you go towards the Middle East or the Far East, if you ingest drugs, even a bit of cannabis or something, you will face the death penalty. People are put to death for having a smoke. And it still does not stop people who want to take the drugs. So even the hardest deterrent does not succeed in stopping the market for the drugs. So this is abject failure across every level. Now, of course, it's not all black. Um, many countries across Europe have seen the madness of the drug laws, and they have been trying to find a little bit of, should we say, wriggle room within the hard and fast UN conventions. And there have been many successes. Uh, come on, I'm speaking in the Netherlands. Of course there have been uh, successes. Because, of course, you decriminalized certain forms of the use and sale of cannabis in 1976. And I believe the statistics show that per capita use of cannabis is half that in the, ne in the Netherlands than it is in the UK and indeed even in the US. Now, the US has very stringent penalties if you're caught with a bit of cannabis. And yet, double the people per capita will take that risk because they want to take that drug of choice. Other countries in Europe have gone even further, of course. Portugal, in, uh, uh, 10 years ago, decided to decriminalize all drugs for personal use. And this came about, I mean, Portugal came out of a rather frightening fascistic era. And it's quite a conservative country, so it was quite unexpected that they, of all countries, made this decision. But they did it because they had a spike in um, heroin use in the 80s, and there were issues and problems, crime and health and spread of AIDS that went on. So the population then decided to say, well, what are we doing about this? How can we protect our communities from increasing drug use? How can we effectively shift things? So despite the dreadful sort of apocalyptic predictions of the, of the uh, politicians who said, well, if we decriminalize drugs, drug use will go up. 
Drug tourism will sort of flow into our country. It'll be a complete mess. Our youth will be ruined forever. But yet, the people voted for this. And over 10 years on, all the statistics coming back show that drug use has gone down. Drug use, particularly amongst the younger generation, has gone down. Drug tourism never happened. And the health benefits have been huge because people are no longer injecting nasty things that can potentially kill them. They can get a safe hit or a fix and do it in a safe environment and get health help if they want it. And of course, there is also the financial peace dividend if you end this war on drugs on the streets, where the money that the local law enforcement would have to pay, you know, just arresting people and processing people and keeping them in prison, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, was saved and could then be spent on clinics, on the health groups that could help people who developed a problem. And let's not forget that most drug use is not a problem. Many people dabble, they have fun, they relax, it's sociable, that's it. Only about 15% of drug users develop an actual health problem that needs treatment. But they're always the ones that are focused on by our media. So Portugal's been a very interesting experiment, and it's provided amazingly good statistics about how you can benefit your society through decriminalization. Other countries also have tried different experiments. Switzerland is great. In 1994, they too had a heroin problem. There were users all over the streets, which, you know, the Swiss like their neat streets. Um, there was a, an explosion of petty property crime to fund habits. And people were getting sick. Now, Switzerland, of course, has a form of direct democracy, where if they want to change the major laws, they go to the people and have a referendum. So they did. And the people voted to allow um, safe drug use, even in the case of people who had a heroin addiction. They set up health clinics where people could go and take their hit with sterile equipment and with a certain known purity of that drug, which meant that the spread of AIDS and other communicable diseases has descended massively which meant that they have had no fatal overdoses since then, and which meant that people felt safe and were treated if they needed health interventions because they d before they'd been too frightened to ask for it in case they were sent to prison. Now they were more open to being able to go and talk to these people and ask for help. So it was a win-win again for Switzerland. And this is an issue that comes up repeatedly. It has been pushed through more referenda since 1994. And the number of people voting for it keeps going up because the, pe the population of Switzerland can see the benefits to their own communities, which is fantastic. And since then, this model of safe clinics, or as they say in the slang, shooting galleries, is being unrolled in many, many other countries. So we have Germany, Denmark, Spain, um, I think the Netherlands, uh, also Australia and France has just started, and Canada, and also even a little experiment in the UK in a, the south coast town of Brighton. So we'll wait to see how that impacts on the assessment of drug decriminalization within the UK. So that's all good. There is some good news out there, and even, actually, the mad country, the fountainhead of drug prohibition, the one that started the war on drugs because it was a useful way to intervene globally in countries of interest, the USA, has just had its 20th state legalize the medicinal use of marijuana. And it, of course, now has two states which have legalized all use of marijuana. In the USA now, in Washington state and Colorado state, you can now smoke cannabis just for fun with your friends. It's a radical idea. Of course, it's going to be interesting to see how that shakes down within the Constitution of the US, because they have a federal government that is very much against ending prohibition, because the vested interests are so big, versus the autonomy of the state legislation. So that's one to watch. Other things of interest, other things that give me hope about the ending of prohibition, are movements in Latin America as well. These are countries that have been brutalized particularly by the US interventions over the last few decades. They have been brutalized, raped, 
environmentally, economically, militarily over the last five decades. But now there is a resurgence of confidence as a geographical grouping, as an ideological political grouping. And they are pushing back. They are saying, we want to rethink about this. The damage that has been wreaked in our countries, the violence that has been caused by the war on drugs in our countries is no longer permissible. We do not want this. And one of the other wonderful anti-prohibition organizations that I've had the pleasure of working with is called the Beckley Foundation. And this combines policy at a very high level and also scientific research so they can provide the facts, the real facts, scientific facts to inform that policy. And we have the head of Beckley here today. She's doing a talk tomorrow about the science um, and policy of the drug war, Amanda Fielding. And she has been advising presidents and prime ministers across Latin America about how they can shift their position and how they can try and challenge or find a way that will be more beneficial to their own communities and their own geographical block. And it's all based on facts rather than this faith-based prohibition, drugs are bad type moralistic stance that we've had for so many decades from the US. So things are looking up. And in fact, there was, um, there's been some very famous statistics that came out from Beckley a few years ago, even in the UK, where it is still virtually forbidden to talk about ending prohibition because we have a mad white right-wing press, particularly something called the Daily Whale, sorry, Mail, I keep saying that, uh, which is a particularly nasty tabloid newspaper. And the figures there were an estimate which just said, if only cannabis, just cannabis, were legalized, but then regulated and controlled and taxed in the way that we do with alcohol or tobacco, if that were done tomorrow, then the estimate would be that the UK Treasury would have um, an increase of 1.6 billion per year, which breaks down to about 1.2 billion in tax, uh, 170 million in terms of law enforcement, the policing on the streets, the wasting of police time, 155 million for the judicial process of putting people through courts and things, and then 135 million wasted on imprisoning drug users who don't harm anyone else. Now that is a big wedge of money per year, and the UK is effectively bankrupt. In fact, many of our European countries are struggling financially. So how can we not think, or at least have a civilized adult and fact-based debate about ending prohibition and regulating and controlling and taxing and educating. I think give us another 50 years and our descendants will look back and think, what the hell were all these oldies doing banning this stuff? Just as we look back on American prohibition and think that's mad and it is mad and it's caused so much global damage, not just to our local communities, but global damage. So I think things are shifting. And I will wrap up shortly, because I hope there'll be quite a lot of questions about this. Things are shifting. I feel a certain degree of hope. And one of the points I made last night was that the war on drugs is the first global war on a noun or a concept, like the war on terror. You can't fight a noun, but it's a very, very good excuse to go and fight everybody else under the banner. So the war on drugs has been a wonderful excuse to intervene, interfere, invade, subvert, fleece many, many countries around the planet. But of course, the US and the rest of the Western countries, the rest of the Western vassal states, as I should call them now, of course, they don't need it anymore. They have the war on terror, which is much more effective for that. It's their bright, shiny new toy. So from that point of view, I think the war on drugs will be allowed to end because they don't need it anymore. But also, I hope and I feel that the advocacy and the policy work that many of our organizations do, getting to the facts, putting the information out there, talking to local communities, rather than this hysterical anti-drug propaganda we get all the time, will make people realize what a failure it is and help to inform our populations, our citizens, to take a vote against prohibition in the way that the citizens of Colorado and Washington in the US have done, and in the way that the many European countries are doing 
by at least decriminalizing personal use. Now, I'm here talking on behalf of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, LEAP. Our position is decriminalization is great because it means that the users who might develop health issues or psychiatric issues, whatever it is, or might not, and might just be having a damn good time, those users should not be treated as criminals. In the worst case, the worst outcome, they are people who need help health-wise. They are patients. They do not need to be put in prison. They do not need to have a criminal record and have their lives ruined for future. However, that is one good outcome of decriminalization, but from our position as law enforcement professionals, we say this does not go far enough. To go back to the beginning of my talk, this is the biggest global crime wave we have ever seen. Prohibition has created a half a trillion dollar underground industry that funds directly violent organized crime cartels it funds directly violent terrorists who are also our acknowledged enemies and we spend billions trying to fight too. And it creates havoc and turf war and violence on a smaller level within our local communities. That is the abject failure of prohibition. So harm reduction, decriminalization for users is great. It's one half of the equation. But of course, we then have to take the next logical step, which is let's legalize and regulate and control because that's the only way we will cut the legs out from under these criminals and these terrorists and these financial banksters. So that is the position of LEAP and that's also the position of many other um, NGOs who are promoting the end of prohibition. Beckley is one. Another very good one in the UK is called Transform. And there are some other good groups like Release which at least are pushing in that direction. Plus we have many, many drug czars. Um, another one is in the Czech Republic, um, who's done great work in pushing forward on this front. So the times, they are indeed a changing. But it would be great to try and up the pace of that change to prevent the more thousands of deaths in countries like Mexico or Afghanistan or overdoses in our countries and our local communities. So what we're trying to do is build awareness, educate people, get the message out there, as I said, we are a bunch of judges and lawyers and police officers and prison governors and drug czars and spooks. We are not out there saying, free the weed so we can smoke our joint. We are saying this whole issue has just been an abject failure and we need to recognize that and take the next rational decision, which is to end the abject failure. So please spread the word about um, the work we're doing. We are always grateful for any assistance we can get, particularly activism, connections with politicians, uh, the opportunity to go out and do more talks about these sort of subjects across Europe, and also, of course, any sort of viral marketing geek magic um, would be very greatly appreciated. So if anyone is free to help, I'd be very happy to hear from you. But I do think, to end, we are looking at the end of times when it comes to the prohibition laws. As I said, one, they don't need them anymore. They have the war on terror. The culture is changing. People realize the damage that has been caused. And I think, I hope, I'm predicting this right, that the war on drugs will be over within a decade. So what we need to do now is to start thinking about how we manage that transition, how we regulate it and protect people, and different countries in different ways experimenting with different regulation models to see what works culturally. But I think that will be the way forward. So I have very great hope on this front. So thank you very much. There will be a time for questions and answers. Please keep, keep them concise and make them questions. <laughs> First, still a remark, because I want to express my appreciation for the work you're doing. And I think it's really very important, and because it's from a different angle, it's, it's much more, uh, gives much more power to the initiative. So I'm, I'm very pleased with uh, police officers and other people from the government uh, to telling this story. Mm -hmm. The other thing is I'm wondering uh, about this regulation. Um, if you talk, say, about alcohol, uh, we do not care that much about regulation. We think that a free market is good enough. 
Probably it's not. Mm. Probably <laughs> we have much deeper addiction problem, which starts with young uh, guys being addicted to internet porn, which triggers their brains to be more suspective to heroin and kind of things like that. So what I wanted to say and ask you is that I think that the addiction problem is much deeper than the drug problem. It's connected to food, it's connected to a lot of things. Do you agree on that? And, um, I would say that, yeah, there's, there's probably a great likelihood. One of the major problems, though, is because all these issues have been buried underground, scientists have not been able to conduct proper research to get the right. proper facts. There's only right. hysteria in certain media. Yeah. You know, cannabis triggers psychosis or whatever it is. There's no proper scientific basis to all this. I think that's the main issue, actually. Yes. And if you, how can you make international or governmental policy without the facts? That's it. So this is actually one of the things that Amanda Fielding would be talking about about the Beckley work, which is scientific research and how it feeds into policy tomorrow. So if you can make that, I don't know what time the talk is. Have a look on the program. Um, but no, I totally agree. Um, and of course, we all know there is such a thing as lies, damned lies, and statistics. Everything can be bent. That's true. I think um, statistics is yeah. a way of expressing your view on reality, but it's yeah. not reality itself. Absolutely. So I think in terms of regulation, first we need some solid facts that we right. can base policy on. And then, of course, each country will be different. I mean, if, we were to cha if, if the UN conventions were abolished and prohibition ended tomorrow, the way that that would have to be worked through and implemented in somewhere like Afghanistan yeah. or Colombia yeah. or the USA yeah. or the UK or the Netherlands. Mexico. It's going to be so different, yes. Yeah. But each country should have the sovereignty to do that and I work have, for the best. I have to turn off my tour. Okay. <laughs> okay. Addressing some of the issue in the fountainhead, as you put it, <laughs> um, one of the things that defeats facts in politics in the United States is money. Yes. Uh, in law enforcement, the group with the largest vested interest to keep the war going would be the prison guards union who do a lot of funding. Can you address what we can do about that? <laughs> yeah, well, I think there's a real problem. America particularly is the vanguard of the military security complex now, not the military industrial, it's military security. And private prisons are booming. It's big business. And they're beginning to pop up in the UK too, so it's the same issue. So yes, there are vested interests. They get a, these private prisons are built, they have to run a profit, they need a certain amount of inmates to make that profit. And the low-hanging fruit for law enforcement, of course, is picking someone up for having a joint. And that's how they get the convictions. That's how it's easier. And then the police officers who make those arrests get performance-related bonuses based on how many arrests they made. Now, if you are someone investigating a serial killer or a murderer or a rapist, that could take you weeks or months. So you'll get one result and you won't get your pay. If you are picking up drug users on the streets and you get 60 a month or something, you get that performance pay. So that's a problem, sure. And then, of course, the prisons want the bodies because that's good for their business model too. The other issue, though, um, I've heard of in the States is that local law enforcement can seize assets which they believe to be from the proceeds of the drug trade or drug use. So people can be innocently driving around and a police officer can flag them down and stop them and say, oh, I suspected you of driving under the influence of drugs. I'm going to impound your vehicle, seize your vehicle, and then that local police organization will keep that vehicle and sell it and keep 70% of those profits. This is how they fund the police, the local police station. It is entirely corrupt. And the frightening thing for me as a Brit is that I'm beginning to see these sort of models coming in in Britain. Yeah, well, be careful when you get the public employees union because then the citizens aren't in the room with the negotiation. You have the union and you have the politician and the union's funding the politician and the politician's yep. funding the union. The citizen's not in the room. So well, it depends which party you're looking at. Yeah, sure, you get the unions, the politicians, or you get big business well, and the, the banks as politicians. Unions, yeah. yeah, all of them, yeah. But no, it's, it's a, I think, a real problem. Um, and I don't know if there is an easy answer. I mean, the state seems so broken, I think is the polite word. <laughs> I, I, I think you're at the sweet spot with the law enforcement and increasing awareness of the issue might help to defeat it, but I just don't know. What yeah, you're I mean, certainly uh, we have speakers all over the states. I mean, that's the biggest country with all our speakers. And they, they go out to the most conservative groups and do talks. And because they are a conservative profession themselves, they do make a lot of impact. It's a very, it's a, it is a unique voice 
within the drug debate to have law enforcers saying this. So if there are any other people involved in this debate in any way, use us because we can add that voice. Um, so you said about um, uh, drug use and that you know being a personal thing for in each individual and things like that, and, and being almost a victimless thing. But surely you're kind of implicitly um, funding this massive uh, you know um, uh, you know set of cartels and things like that. So you're, surely it's not a victimless thing if you're funding these 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 organisations. That's one, one question. And then the other part point is uh, so if we switch to uh, supply via the government, surely we're just exchanging one set of gangsters for another <laughs> set. Well, if that's your definition of government, I wouldn't disagree. <laughs> um, it's difficult. I mean, particularly America has been one of the most draconian pushbacks against drugs. And yet America also has this inc incredibly strong neoliberal economic model. So you think, if there is a market then you should supply that market. And if that's going to happen anyway, despite the legal risks, why not have some sort of control and t of regulation and taxation over it? <coughs> because it's good for the economy. You would think that would be the logical neoliberal approach to this. But there's a quite strong moralistic thing. Um, but yes, I think the, the vested interests are very strong. It's, it's very difficult to try and break this hegemony. But it, the people are rising up in certain states, so it's shifting. What was your second question? Uh, well, that was, that was it, the two wrapped into one. Bit. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, I've got a question from the internet, actually, and you almost just uh, answered it, I think. Okay. Uh, but what, to, to what extent do you think the um, current economic crisis, if it carries on, would ease lawmaking towards, you know, ending prohibition, given the potential tax income? Oh, God. Um, that's a difficult one, because... The vested interests and the sort of ethos of lawmakers are so embedded in this culture, it's going to be very difficult to shift. Having said that, they are there to apply the law, they're not there to change the law. What we have to do to change the law has to be the UN, it has to be our nation states and other international bodies. Um, but no, the vested interests are so embedded, you know, they've been there for 50 years, we're talking a few generations now who've worked on this. Having said that, of course, we've also seen whole communities decimated in that time by the war on drugs. Um, but, and particularly in the US, I think they have 25% of the world's prisoners. In, this goes back to the industrial prison complex, with only 5% of the world's population. So trying to break that business model, I think, is going to be the most difficult thing. And also the financial stranglehold. I mean, what are the banks going to do? Hey, uh, what do you think about the emergence of these new peer-to-peer -peer black markets like Silk Road based on Bitcoin and Anonymous trade? It's basically screwed prohibition. It can't, use, it can't work anymore. And it'll just be used. One, there is no way they can control it, no way they can regulate it. It's one of the most blatant free market economies I've ever seen. And two, of course, they will then use that excuse to try and break things like Bitcoin and crack down on private communications. The war on drugs, paedophilia, terrorism, let's invade your privacy online. It's another one. But I can't see that they're going to be able to break this. The, the, in, the sort of intelligence infrastructure trying to track down all this sort of stuff. We hear all these terrible things coming out of, you know, from Edward Snowden, prism and tempera and, you know, all the rest of it. And yet, and yet, we still see these lumbering, monolithic sort of intelligence agencies coming out with this stuff and still being outpaced and having circles run around them by nimble groups of hackers and activists. And that's what, one of the things that really gives me hope. So I don't think they've got a chance against that. Yeah, you've been talking a lot about vested interests in the state uh, of affairs as it is. Mm -hmm. uh, aren't there also some unlikely allies to look for, such as the pharmaceutical industry that would be uh, the ones who produce uh, the real stuff in really, really good quality and might be, might be interested to join, uh, to join the good fight once they feel that it is no longer uh, associated with uh, crime image and, and bad press and all that. It's an interesting question about the pharmaceutical industry because there could potentially be a business. I mean, we know that certain big businesses are already looking at a post-prohibition market and what can be done and how they can profit from it. Um, having said that, it would be very difficult for the big pharmaceutical companies to make a profit off some of the 
drugs like MDMA or cannabis or LSD because they're out of patent. How do they, you know, unless they change something slightly, it's very difficult for them to take a profit. So I think on the one hand, they're generally seen as one of the opposition groups, along with the alcohol lobby or the tobacco lobby or the law enforcement lobby, trying to keep prohibition in place because it's good for their current business model. But yes, some of the more forward thinking ones are looking ahead. Um, and of course, we're also looking at the legal highs market now, where companies change, or organizations change one little atom or molecule in a drug, so suddenly it's legal, and the law can't keep up with this. So something's got to break at some point. Hello, that actually leads into my question. And first, thank you so much for giving the talk. I found it incredibly optimistic. And I return <laughs> with a rather pessimistic question. Okay. Which is, assuming that all of the efforts that are going on, and there seem like there are quite a few, to uh, stop this, uh, what I consider to be an injustice, what happens if things stay the way that they are and all of those efforts fail? Like, what's the end goal? How long can this go on? Well, it has failed already. I mean, you know, millions and millions of people take illegal drugs despite even facing the death penalty. So it has failed. It's just a case of how we can manage a more humane approach. And I'm not sure if the UN or our national governments will really do that. But I think that as the economies tank more, particularly in the US and some other Western countries, it's going to be financially unviable to keep the standard model. It's not going to be any sort of sense of humanity or logic or justice coming out of our governments. It's going to be pure utilitarianism. But we're already seeing this across much of Europe. I mean, for example, the um, cannabis social clubs in France and Spain and Belgium and the Czech Republic and even Britain, um, where it's a sort of non-profit social model. Um, so I think things will shift like that. And I think they will realize, the governments will realize economically they need to make a, a change because it's unviable otherwise. The other problem, of course, is they're going to be under pressure from the big lobby groups. And we've seen recently the UK government cave into the, the tobacco lobby again about blank packaging. So okay, I think you. as the system breaks. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Uh, Annie will be available in the media cafe afterwards for a short while. Well, Annie will possibly be there. She wants to come. Annie wants to come to the Jeremy Zimmerman talk straight after this here. So. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> one question and try to find her. She's really recognisable there. So. Hi. Um, my question is: What's your opinion on what's going to happen to the drug lords when it's all legalised? They don't know better. Probably aren't schooled to do something else. What's your opinion? What's going to happen to them? The drug. The drug lords themselves. Oh, the we, drug lords. We legalize all the... That's a, a good question. This is something my mother keeps throwing at me, saying, where are all the criminals going to go? <laughs> well, I mean, there's quite enough crime for them to be involved in. You know, they're already involved in trafficking and arms and all the rest of it. Just because one thing goes doesn't mean they're going to disappear. What it does mean, though, that law enforcement and the whole judicial process and everything else will not have to focus on trying to interdict that aspect of their work, their criminal activities. They will have, therefore, more time and more resources to focus on the other aspects and try and, you know, damp down terrorism or arms smuggling or people trafficking or prostitution or many, many other damaging societal issues. So they won't go away. They'll probably shift and adapt as everyone does. Yeah. But um, it will free up people to focus, you know, the law enforcement to focus on those new activities, all these existing activities, where at the moment they're just running after the low hanging fruit to get their statistics up. Um, and this is precisely what we saw in Portugal after decriminalization, that the police didn't have to run after the people using drugs, they could focus on the higher up people within the drug trade. So I think that will be a positive thing. Thank you. One more question or are you? One more question, there's okay. one more person. Final question. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, you. You mentioned the size of the drug trade, the half a trillion, uh -huh. and then you also mentioned the, de the dependency for large banks, the liquidity that they need. And so if drug trade would go away, then if, if that's really true that the banks are so dependent on it, that would be a catastrophe for them. And so my question to you is, how, tr how true do you think it is that the banks are really so dependent on that trade? I was merely quoting a very senior UN official. <laughs> he said that their liquidity was dependent. The estimates of the drug trade are between 320 billion and half a trillion per year, conservative and less conservative. The banks will be screwed. I mean, they, they 
have been caught out laundering huge amounts of money. It is very good for business and everything. But they're screwed anyway because of their casino banking over the last couple of decades, where they have privatized the profit and made pro public the risk where we all have to cough up and we have to pay when they make mistakes, but they still trouser the money when they win money. So that's a broken financial system anyway. And by legalizing the drug trade or regulating the drug trade, I'm sure there'll be money there to be made accounting and doing all the taxation and regulation. But yeah, they're going to be in trouble. But they've been breaking the law left, right and center in many areas. Is that an excuse for us to keep propping up what is a broken business model? Or should we do something that's more beneficial for the wider population of the world? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Can I... <laughs> Thank you very much, and can I just reiterate that there will be a, a talk looking at um, the policy and the scientific research with Amanda Fielding in this tent at some point tomorrow afternoon, I can't remember the precise time, and the Beckley Foundation that she runs is just starting two serious research projects with Professor David Nutt, who's one of their scientists in the UK, looking at the therapeutic benefits of what are currently illegal drugs, so that we can start to get some facts injected into the political debate, so I do recommend that talk too.